Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. I'm Princeton sophomore Neil Reddy. We're so excited to welcome Professor Sandro Galea to the show. Professor Galea is a Robert A. Knox professor and dean at the Boston University School of Public Health. His scholarship centers on the social determinants of health, mental health, and the long-term effects of trauma. Professor Galea's work is held in high esteem and has been recognized by many organizations and outlets, such as Time Magazine. Today, we'll focus on his forthcoming book, The Contagion Next Time, which we here at Policy Punchline were so fortunate to receive early access to. Professor Galea, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah. Um, all right. So I guess to start, could you briefly take us through your, your journey as a physician and a scholar and, and what made you exactly take on the project of studying public health? Yeah, so I, uh, I trained as a physician in uh, Canada. I went to the University of Toronto Medical School and I did a residency in rural remote medicine and emergency medicine. And then I practiced medicine for a few years in some remote parts of the world. I was in Northern Canada. I was in uh, Papua New Guinea. I was in uh, Somalia as a field doctor for Medicine and Frontier. And I think it was the Somalia experience that really uh, pivoted me to public health and population health, largely out of a sense of wanting to understand the forces that keep people healthy. When I was in Somalia. I was in uh, an area, I was in Mudok province, which is an area of about 350,000 people. And I was the only doctor there. And I was doing a lot of medicine. I was doing a lot of good, I think, as a doctor. But I became frustrated with the limitations of medicine. And I wanted to learn why that was and what it is that one could do to improve health in the long term. So I decided I needed to learn more about health, how health is generated, and learn more about health in the long term. So I went back to school and did a master's in public health and a doctorate in public health. And then for the past 20 years, I've had an academic career in public health, schools of public health, and I consider what I do population health science. And I've been at the New York Academy of Medicine, University of Michigan, Columbia University, and now for the past seven years or so as dean at the Boston University School of Public Health. And within that, my scholarship has been at around the social economic drivers of health. That's a very broad area. I've done work around things like urbanization and migration and discrimination, structural forces that shape health. I've had a particular interest in mental health, particularly common with anxiety disorders and in trauma and the consequences of trauma. So that's been really the subject of what I've done a lot of my scholarship around. Obviously in, in a role as a Dean of School of Public Health, I have the great privilege of trying to shape the school and create the conditions for other scholars to do their work and to do and to make their contributions to the science. And a lot of what I've been doing as Dean, apart from the obviously the administrative structural pieces, is to try to use my voice to advance the vision of public health, one that is engaged in issues of contemporary consequence and one that that leans into data with passion and purpose, and one that leans into data that advances arguments for what we need to do as society to create a healthier world. And that's in part what this book that we're talking about tries to do. Yeah, that, that, that's really interesting that you, that you mentioned that, Professor Gulea, just because I think we've kind of seen this sort of tension between a lot of different areas of expertise and how we've addressed COVID-19 in particular um, and, and you mentioned that public health is a more interdisciplinary, it, it requires lots of areas of expertise. And um, so, so what do you think is the biggest challenge in, in weaving together all these sort of different fields and perspectives that could be really useful to public health, such as data, as you mentioned, or, or even um, social policy? Right. Yeah, it's a good question. I think there are two main challenges. Number one, one is language. And the other one is mechanics. So let me talk about each of them. By language, I mean that we tend to forget that we all are socialized as we do our training in our particular area. And be that an area within public health or be that an area in engineering and whatever it is. And we develop our own languages and our ways of thinking. And sometimes I really feel like when you're trying to work across disciplines, 
it's like you're speaking different languages. And I, I often find it quite amusing, but also a little bit alarming about how the people who are in my area, I know exactly what they mean. I know exactly what they're talking about. I know what their motivations are. But then I talk to say somebody in architecture and they just have a whole different way of looking at the world and a whole different way of interacting with that world for the scholarship. And that creates challenges. It actually is quite difficult to talk to people around the disciplines. I mentioned architecture as an example because I've done work and I've written books about cities and health, for example. So colleagues in urban planning and architecture are natural partners. Often though, I'm, I'm amazed as to how differently the, our colleagues in architecture, urban planning think compared to how people in public health think. So I think number one is language. I think language is a real barrier and it is a function of the disciplinary silos and the professionalization of particular disciplines, which in and of itself is not a bad thing, but it push, puts us into particular modes of thinking and being, which are which make it hard to work across those modes. That's number one. The second one is mechanics. And the mechanics, I've referred to this a little bit in context of incentives across academic disciplines. But when you get into the world outside of the academy, for example, it is one thing to say that housing matters for health. It's another thing altogether for, let's say, a secretary of housing and urban development to invest resources in housing to the end of improving health. Because typically, the good people who are have policy responsibility and pragmatic responsibility for, let's say, housing, using that as an example, they have an incentive set that typically does not have health as a part of it. So it's actually quite difficult for them to do their job and live and, and be consistent with their incentives and to do what health would like them to do. So I think there are mechanical challenges. And sometimes this problem, this latter problem, uh, sometimes is referred to as the other pocket problem. And by the other pocket problem, it means that you have to take money from one pocket and put it in the other pocket. And uh, these siloed structures around which we structure our society have a hard time as a result coming together towards a common goal like health. So I think both of those are real problems in advancing cross-disciplinary, cross-entity type work. And unfortunately, I have come to feel like that is entirely necessary to advance health. You cannot in the same breath say, let's stick with cities for a second, that cities matter for health, and then avoid the difficult issue of how is it that we can have interdisciplinary scholarly work that really embraces the full spectrum of how cities shape health, and pragmatically, how we can have the housing group work with the financing group, work with the sanitation group, so that all of them create healthier cities. Both of these, both the disciplinary challenges and the logistical challenges are problems that we should work towards overcoming. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Um, I, I think the idea of, of silos and academia is, we, we've heard that a lot from the scholars we interview, the, the idea that just structural factors kind of prevent um, uh, collaboration in, in a lot of cases. Um, and, and so I'd like to move on and onto uh, your, your book, um, The Contagion Next Time. And um, before, before I really get into the topics of your book, could you just describe to us what health actually means to you? And like, how would you measure health? Because I think it's a very broad term. It can be, mean a lot of different things to different people. Um, and so how do you think it should be measured? And, and what are your principles in determining what actually constitutes health? Yeah, it's an excellent question. So I would probably lean on the World Health Organization preamble to the WHO Constitution, which broadly says that health is not simply the absence of sickness, but is a state of complete physical and mental and social well-being. I, I, to translate that, I consider health to be a means, not an end. And by that, I mean health should be a means that towards us all flourishing and living a full life and doing with our life whatever we want it to be. If I may use a very simple metaphor, health is having a car that runs well. The, the car running well is a healthy car, but 
that's not the point. The point of the car is so that it can take you from place A to place B, right? That's the purpose. So you want your car to run well so that you can actually, so the car can actually take you to your destination. Similarly with health, health in and of itself should be a state where you and I can live long, healthy lives and do with our lives what we wish to do and, and realize that life as fully or as richly as we'd like to do it. So that's how I see health. I see health as a means of not an end. And when one sees health that way, it has important implications for how we go about seeing health. And it creates an opportunity for us to see health as a unifying motivation, no question about it. Health can be uh, motivating because it we all want to be healthy. We all want to be able to realize our life. But it also aligns health with other core values that we hold dear as a society. So for example, we value individual autonomy and we value the uh, our ability to be informed by reason towards creating a better world and these are enlightenment values i'm talking about and similarly we should value health and i think the reason it's important to recognize that and to see health as part of these of the set of values is because it becomes important in a time when we have a pandemic for example when you're trying to figure out how to prioritize and when you say if health is a means not an end and health's not the only end then how do we balance what we do to keep health in mind and keep these other values also in mind? Yeah, that's, I think that's a very um, easy to understand definition. Um, the idea that like health is a means, not an end is, is very interesting, and, but it somewhat counteracts how modern medicine is sort of structured. And um, we've seen a focus on the end over the last century, I, I would say, especially with the advancements in the pharmaceutical industry um, as you know, um, Moderna and, and other companies such as Moderna have, have really made great innovations and are really focusing on, on the direct medicine um, sort of way of, of treating health. We've had George Church of Harvard and Robert Langer of, of, on, of Moderna on the show, and they, they both gave us great insights on that, on that fact. However, you seem to argue that there's like deeper inequalities within health and which have persisted even with these um, innovations. Um, do you think that's a fair characterization that that these innovations are sort of occurring without realizing the, the more deeper inequalities? And is that what you seem to argue in, in, in your book? Yeah, so I, I think I make a an, an end argument, not an or argument. I want to be very clear about that. And perhaps I'll, I'll lean on a metaphor that I've written about in other books, which is I often use, which is a metaphor of a soccer team. So if you want to play a game of soccer, you have the goalie and you have 10 other players. And in order to win at soccer, it's not good enough to have the world's best goalkeeper. You actually need to have 10 other players to move the ball forward and to score on the other side. The goalkeeper is medicine and clinical care. The goalkeeper keeps the ball out of the net. When we're sick, the goalkeeper is medicine. And we want a good doctor, a good nurse, a good healthcare system, good technology to keep us, to keep us from dying. But we would rather the ball not even get to the goalie. We'd rather the other 10 players move the ball upfield. And the other 10 players are education, stable employment, livable wages, absence of violence, gender equity, clean air, drinkable water. Those are the other 10 players. And I argue, in fact, that well, those are 10 players versus one player. So we need to make, pay attention to those 10 players. There's a lot of other players. And my fundamental argument is that we as a society have grown accustomed to thinking only about the goalie, to thinking only about clinical care and medicine. And in the context of a pandemic, which is now where the book comes in, the vaccines that have emerged are extraordinary, extraordinary. And uh, they are kudos to the Modernas, the Pfizer's who did the work and really kudos to our system. Because remember, all these vaccines are fundamentally they come from federal funds that support the development of these kind of ideas. And that's been fabulous and transformative. And that's the goalie. I want to make sure we don't forget about the other forces that made the pandemic the tragedy that it was. Because let's face it, COVID has been a tragedy. We've had needless loss of life in large part because of our social and economic circumstances, not because of the coronavirus itself. 
Yeah, that's that's very that's very interesting. I, I really like that the analogy of, of the goalie and, and and the soccer team. Um, and I think that could also speak lar- like to a, a larger point of why there is some distrust towards the healthcare system. Um, I think we've seen in in the disinformation a lot of the the points they make are are related to how medicine is sort of ignoring all these other factors of healthy living. Like we see people arguing about taking vitamins in, in lieu of the vaccine and vitamins are great and, and they promote a, a more general, greater like sort of well-being um, and, and exercise as well. Um, so, so do you see like some sort of distrust coming from the fact that we focus solely on, on medicine and not the overall scope yeah. of well-being? That's an, that's an excellent, excellent question. I do think that some of the distrust that now we have seen realized in the context of mistrust of vaccines stems from the fact that we, and by we, I mean collectively society, have advanced a notion of health that is contrary to people's lived experience. So let's take some concrete examples. Before COVID in 2016, 17, 18, life expectancy in America had gone backwards, it had dipped. It was the first time we had a three year, year on year drop in life expectancy since uh, the other previous pandemic, since the 1918 pandemic. So you had people in large parts of the country who are seeing their health get worse at the same time as they are seeing these trumpeted advances in precision medicine and in the excellence of our medical system. And that was just dissonant with people's lived experience who we were seeing their neighbors die of opioid overdose. They're seeing the fact that uh, there is unnecessary maternal mortality. They are seeing the fact that uh, there are high burdens of depression and suicide. And when you when you see that from the perspective then of the population, is it any wonder that the population is saying, well, all the experts keep telling me that we're doing ever better on medicine with all these shiny new tools, but I don't see that in my own life. I don't see in my own life how my health is getting better or the health of my neighbors is getting better. So we collectively created a a narrative that health is a private good. It's a personal good, something that you or I can buy for ourselves, but actually it's not true. What we can buy for ourselves is sick care. That's different than buying health. Health fundamentally is a public good because it stems from our shared experiences, the conditions of where we live, where we work, where we play. And I think at some level, people get that in their bones. And when that then runs counter to the broader narrative, it creates mistrust. Is it then any wonder that you come to a time of vaccines where you tell everybody, trust us, the vaccine's fine, that a substantial proportion of the population says, hmm, I'm not sure I trust you. you know, I'm often asked, what yeah. can we do now to make people trust the vaccine? To which my answer is, I don't think we can do anything now to make people trust the vaccine because what we need to do is make sure that people trust the system that generates health at a time when we don't have a crisis, not in the middle of a crisis. You know, to use another metaphor, you don't go about fixing your boat when you're in a storm. You want to make sure your boat is fixed when the waters are calm and the sun is out. That's when you fix your boat. And right now we're in the middle of a storm and we're saying, oh, we need to patch the boat. It's going to be pretty hard to patch the boat right now. So, so you'd argue towards a, a more greater restructuring of how, how health is, is, is conveyed to the general public? Would you say that, like, would, would this occur on, on the front of doctors and, and providers or maybe just through government and messaging? Like, how, what's the avenue for, for such a change? Yeah. To happen? Well, the, the very simple answer to your last question is yes, because it's all of those. Right. My previous book before this one was called Well, but the subtitle was What We Need to Talk About When We Talk About Health. So that book was really trying to say, we need to talk about these other things when we talk about health, that we need people sitting around their kitchen table and when asked the question, what do you think matters most for your health? People don't instinctively say doctors and hospitals, but rather they say politics and where I live. And we've actually done surveys on this and we actually know what people say. People still say mostly doctors and hospitals. The idea is getting out there. The idea is getting out there that the world around us matters for our health but it's going to take time. It's going to take time for that to see through. Now, why does it matter? It matters because 
once the general population understands that the conditions of where you live, work or play affect your health, I think the general public will demand that decision-making happens in such a way as to improve those conditions in order to improve our health. One of the projects that was recently involved in I had the privilege of uh, leading a commission that was a, co a joint effort between the um, Rockefeller Foundation, Boston University, and it was called the 3D Commission. It was about bringing data to bear on understanding the determinants of health to make for better decision-making. Data dis determines decision-making, hence the 3D. And the whole point of the commission was to say, how do we get better at measuring these broader determinants that I'm talking about so that we can make decision-making that promotes health? And that decision-making that promotes health can only emerge if there is a substrate that is receptive to it. It can only emerge if there is a substrate that is amenable to it. And that substrate is ultimately what we collectively talk about when we talk about health. You know, I'll give you a, uh, I've written this in another book, I call it a party trick, which is to say, when you're at a bar or at a party or a dinner with friends, start a conversation about health. And you can say something like, hey, I listened to this podcast about health. And, and set your watch or your smartphone's timer, whatever, and see how long it takes in a conversation like that before somebody uses the word healthcare interchangeably with health. And it's always under five minutes that somebody, when they mean health, they say healthcare. And we are so accustomed to healthcare being a substitute for health. And that's just because we tend to see the production of health as being all about healthcare, when in fact, it's not. In fact, it's a minority of health that's about health. Yeah, yeah, that's that's certainly a point I've, I've experienced in, in anecdotally. And I, I see that as a very fair characterization of, of how we think about health. But I kind of want to circle back to this idea that uh, that it, it's a, is it an American problem that, that we conceive of health this way? And has it always been an American problem? Because you, in your book, you argue that there's this been this movement since the Reagan era that kind of has reduced social spending. And, and do you see this sort of narrowing of, of health come from that? Or is it a, a larger narrative of individual, rugged individualism in America? What do you think kind of caused this problem in the, yeah. the grand scheme? The answer to this question is the same as my answer to your last question, which is <laughs> yes. Because, <laughs> because you're articulating all the factors actually. And I, I, yeah. uh, I, I respect that. Because the answer is yes, it's all those things. And you know, let's look at some data. So America spends more on health than any other country in the world, by quite a bit. We're about 40% yeah. more health spending than any other country in the world. Having said that, we have we live shorter and sicker lives than any other comparable high-income country. Okay. My challenge to us is this: name one other sector where we spend more and we get less. I actually don't think you can think of any other sector. If I were to say to anybody listening to this, look, your smartphone is going to cost more, 40% more, not just a little bit more, right? So a, let's say a $200 smartphone is now going to cost $280. Then one you can buy in another high income country, but it's also going to have, be slower and hold less data. You're going to think twice about buying the smartphone. So this runs counter to how we think, but it is the case for health. And the reason it's the case for health is very simple. It's because we invest only in the goalie, to go back to my soccer metaphor, right? And we're not investing in the other pillars that also promote health. So that, to me, speaks to a fundamental problem in how we see health. What has brought us here? I do think there's been a dramatic shift in the past 40 years, which has come from an era of... Uh, deregulation where we stopped collectively believing in public goods. And I think health got caught up in that. I don't think the, the shifts that we saw in Reagan area were targeted at health. I think health got caught up in a, in a wholesale restructuring of how we think about public good. I think it had appeal in terms of the American ethos around autonomy, but I, I never think that, I don't think individual autonomy is in, at all at odds with, uh, with what I'm talking about. I, I actually see individual autonomy as a core part of a set of enlightenment principles that should inform how we think about health. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, and I think that there's this idea that the America's always been this way. And 
that's certainly not been the case with certain, like the progressive reforms in, in the early 20th century that were really emphasizing health on on a large scale, whether it be through public health boards and et cetera. But I think one factor that really came from that is the the, the uh, racial and, and um, social trauma generated by a lot of public health measures in the past, whether it be through quarantining or through um, embedded systemic racism. Um, do you think there's a role that, that we need to take to dissolve sort of that, that, that the, the distrust that came from um, our history of, of including um, racist and, and um, discriminatory policies in public health? Like, how do you think that relates to how we move forward now? I think that's, I don't think we can have for a second, has such a deep history of systemic efforts to marginalize particular groups, particular minoritized groups, and particularly historically Black Americans for hundreds and hundreds of years, which of course breaches apotheosis in the institution of slavery, but slavery then gave way to Jim Crow laws and to years and years of segregation, that how could one avoid that structural racism plays a role in shaping our world. So to my mind, it is the role of anybody who's interested in health to recognize that and to make sure that we are part of the effort to undo the consequences of the structural racism. And that's, that's really difficult, right? It's difficult and it should rightly be front and center of our attention until we no longer feel those influences. And it's going to be a while before we no longer feel those influences. Yeah, certainly. Um, and I, I guess one of my, my curiosities is like towards how much has that, like that those larger forces played a role in, in the current vaccine now? Is it sort of just this theorized um, like impact or are, are you seeing actual examples and data that show that vaccine denial and, and, and the like have especially in, in communities such as the black community have stemmed from historical mistrust. Is, is it like, have you well, seen the, it being measured or? Absolutely, the, the, the uptake of, we know that the uptake of vaccine has, is uh, totally patterned by a racial ethnic group. And we know that uh, uh, black Americans have lower vaccine uptake than do other racial groups. And that's not surprising, right? It's, uh, right. it's um, when, you have, when you have, when black Americans have seen historic that their needs are not being tended to, that their health is worse than, let's just take white Americans by way of comparison, although other groups as well. It, it strikes me as utterly unsurprising that when we say, well, here's this new, really new, part of the process approach which is what the vaccines are, and you should, quote, trust the system and take the vaccine, that you're going to have lower uptake among groups of people who have historically felt not represented by and excluded from the system, the dominant system. So in, in many respects, we are reaping what we sowed and we sowed mistrust over the years because we created conditions of inequity that were deeply patterned, socially patterned, economically patterned, embedded into our system through forces of structural racism and other structural, structural means of marginalizing groups. And when then there was a crisis, one cannot simply say to any group that's been marginalized or uh, uh, systematically discriminated against in a way and say, well, don't worry about that. Let, let's just move beyond that because now it's important that we're all in it together. Well, it doesn't really work that way. And I, I hope that among the learnings of the pandemic time is just this, to say that we need to make sure that we have trust in these systems among all groups. And that trust should be achieved, not in the middle of the storm, but when the waters are calm. Yeah, that, yeah, that's, I think I, I certainly agree with that, that uh, the notion that perhaps healthcare isn't necessarily just, our health isn't necessarily just dealing with the emerge, the immediate problems and perhaps it could be preventative. At, at did, you, did you use the word healthcare instead of health? I just did, and I corrected you, myself. You, and you caught yourself, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. But wasn't that cool? Like, like yeah. that's the point. I, was, I believe it was five minutes since I mentioned it. 
yeah, that's that's very funny. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I hope I hope you don't mind. I'm not calling you out, I'm, but I'm actually I'm actually pointing out like I do it myself as well. Like we're so yeah. accustomed, right? We're so accustomed to saying healthcare instead of health, and right. it matters. It matters because that's actually not what we mean. And once we keep saying that, it just ingrains in people's mind. Well, it's all about healthcare. Correct. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's that's funny. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So. I'd like to sort of shift to another topic you covered in your book, which is global health and, and um, beyond sort of our domestic problems. Um, and so in the book, you asked the question, if we, as people who are living in, in with benefits of the global health disparities, in, like, especially in America and the West, can allow issues like tuberculosis, which are highly preventative to persist in areas such as the global South. And, and if you think it's morally required for Western countries to give larger amounts of aid. So, so what, what are your thoughts on our requirements, like morally towards um, issues in, in global health? Yeah, so I don't know how we could defend, I think it's indefensible, the fact that there are enormous health differentials across the world. Why is it that if one takes a philosophical approach and take a Rawlsian approach, why is it that if you're born in country X, you can expect to live 30 more years than if you're born in country Y? That, that, that strikes me as it, it defeats any core principle of social justice. So at a, at a philosophical level, global health inequity should be unacceptable to all of us. And I do think we have a moral obligation to do everything within our power to work to undo that. And I often ask myself, 200 years ago, what is it that people born to privilege found acceptable that today we find unacceptable? I mean, take, take people born in privilege in, uh, let's say, London. And they found it acceptable that there were outbreaks of cholera all the time that affected the poor. Today, we would find it unacceptable. So part of what we do should be to take things that are acceptable and make them unacceptable. There's a concept which I've written about, but um, really building on the work of uh, Vickers who wrote about this in the, in the 1950s. So I do think that global health inequity should be unacceptable. Now, there was a second part to your question, though, where you said, well, do you then think that we should give more aid? I, I think the question of to use the word giving aid is a really, really complicated question. I'm not sure that the, and I'm, I'm focusing on the phrase giving aid, that the giving of aid is the solution. There are many, many good economic analyses of the impact of the concept of just giving aid. Fundamentally, I think global health inequity rests on inequities in global assets and unless we deal with the global imbalance of assets, we are not going to deal with global health equity in a meaningful way. And just to take a concrete example, you know, we take it, we find it acceptable. Let's talk about things we find acceptable. We find it acceptable today that our clothes that are bought in this country are made in another country because wages are lower. Now, we know from abundant epidemiologic evidence that lower wages, lower incomes are directly associated with poorer health. So why should it be acceptable that it's part of the normal course of global trade that we know that certain countries we just pay them less money because that way it makes your t-shirt and my shirt um, cheaper. So I'm saying that just to illustrate how embedded these inequities are. And if we're serious about addressing global health equity, we need to address these issues. And in saying that, I realize these are just enormous issues. These are enormous issues of global structure. But I also think it is not wrong to say that there are global structural racism patterns that have determined the distribution of assets across countries over time. A lot of this caught up in colonial legacies, but not exclusively. And those need to be addressed in order to rectify these imbalances. Fundamentally, we should live in a world where no one's health is indexed 
to the misfortune or fortune of their birth. That doesn't matter where you're born in the world, you have the same opportunity for life course exposures that create your health so that you can then choose to realize your potential. And I realize in saying that, that somebody listening to this may say, well, that's a you know, fanciful pipe dream. That's okay. I, I would prefer to call it an aspiration. I prefer to call it an aspiration. And I think the more of us who aspire towards that, the more chance we, are, we have of getting there. One of my favorite definitions of public health is that public health is an aspiration. And I do think it is. And I, I suppose I make no apologies for that. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly very admirable um, and, like end goal. Um, but indeed, like going back to what you said about like assets and like the inequality of assets, could you like describe further what, what you mean by that? And like, do you see any intangible ways that we could potentially work towards that? Well, I think, uh, well, obviously the statement saying inequality of assets is an enormous statement, but let's, let's take a concrete asset. It's a, let's take a clean air. Well, air is differentially clean or less clean in different countries in the world as driven largely by levels of pollution in particular industries in particular countries. That's just an asset, right? An asset, clean air. Um, why should that be the case? Like, why is it acceptable that if you are a child born in China today, you are going to have a greater risk of asthma because of air pollution than if you're a child born in Los Angeles today? Like, why is that okay? It shouldn't be okay. Now, the reason I'm choosing one narrow example is to illustrate how big the problem is because it's an enormous problem. How do you then reduce pollution in China? Right? That's clean air. Let's take, an, take another asset. Let's take um, um, stable housing. Why is it acceptable that if you are born in Denmark today, you have access to warm, comfortable housing, which is reasonably spaced? Well, if you're born in Malawi, you're probably living multi-generations to a single room, which then makes the transmission of the disease much easier. Now, we just accept that, right? It's just how it is. And I realize, again, I sound Pollyannish by saying this. Well, what are you saying? How are we going to fix it? I mean, this is like changing the fundamental architecture of the world. All I'm saying is, probably shouldn't be acceptable. Like th this is simply random, random luck of birth that predisposes one to healthier or less healthy lives. And if we don't think that, that if we think we have a moral obligation to narrow health, global health gaps, then we should have a moral obligation to nar narrow global asset gaps in the same way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and I, I think that that idea has been echoed by many, like I, I'm thinking of Peter Singer and and also a lot of famous utilitarians who, who argue for um, this sort of redistribution, also the idea that, that we are morally responsible for, for the fate of others, if, like, even if we can, or especially when we can prevent um, that, that very easily. But for the larger, less preventable problems, do, do you see like international institutions working together as, as a potential way to figure out how we can deal with issues such as climate change affecting different areas of people um, unequally. Like, do you see any sort of like place to start with this? I think it's unavoidable that you need cross national institutions and bodies that create frameworks, agreements and treaties that are enforceable and to which countries are, ex are accountable in order to do some of these things. But what we're talking about is enormous. What we're talking about is huge. If, if one buys the argument that fundamentally one needs to level the asset playing field in order to level the health playing field, you're dealing with essentially remodeling the entire flow of assets in the world. That's just an enormous task. So I don't think the question is there, there will be no such thing as an international treaty on assets because there's no such thing. I think one needs to look at it on a case by case basis. Take the clean air. The clean air, you see, a, you're seeing a lot of climate activism right now, which fundamentally is geared at reducing the level of pollution, among other things. And I think that ultimately will have tremendous health implications. So we, we both know how difficult it is to achieve that, let alone some of the other asset equilibration that we're talking about. So I don't think the fact that it's difficult to achieve 
should deter us from talking about it, should deter us from aspiring to it, should deter us from saying this is a this is a worthwhile moral purpose that is worth our efforts. It's worth you and I dedicating our our mind space to it and seeing how in our in each of our spheres we can move in that direction. Now the question becomes, well, what can I do about it? And and the answer is each of us have particular spheres of influence, and we should simply be honest about making sure that uh, we use our sphere of influence towards advancing this kind of moral purpose. To do that, one should have clarity of moral purpose, which is presumably what this kind of conversation aims to do. It help, aims us, helps us to sort out what we mean by some of these concepts. It helps us articulate what we mean by some of these concepts. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think that that point of um, once we take that, that moral problem as, as to be true, um, there's, there's, a, there's a host of, of ways we could potentially move towards it. Um, but going back to the idea that, that we have to assume that the moral problem is, is true, and it's a, probably a very um, real and objective way of, of thinking about it. Um, regardless, there, there are many people who, who disagree, and we've seen people in positions of power, especially President Donald Trump, and you mentioned Brexit as, as policy actions that are largely political, but resemble this sort of um, shrinking from the international sphere. Um, and, and so do you, do you think that perhaps like this, this sort of shrinking away from, from the international sphere has like some sort of root in, in like, is there like a kernel of truth there or, or is this just, do you think political self-interest and, and, and as a result, it's, it's affecting millions of lives and yeah. like, where, where do you see those political moves, which you mentioned in your book? Um, yeah. And, and, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean that, that that is many questions you're asking in one. Yeah, and uh, the um, let me tr let me try to sort of peel it a little bit. The I suppose I'm pretty confident that the long moral arc will move the world in the right direction. That's number one. That's my that's my leaning into the hope statement. Mm -hmm. Number two, the achieving big complex sets of progress is always takes time and it always requires the the argument of competing visions and competing aspirations you and i may agree on this aspiration probably we probably you and i probably agree much more than we disagree and there are reasons for that because we both are well there's selection bias and the fact that you were interested in this book and i was interested in writing this book and because probably we both come from particular academic socializations that lead us in this direction that doesn't mean that there are there is not 30 40 percent maybe 50 percent of people in the country who might disagree with this aspiration and part of what we need to do is is have the jockeying of ideas to come up with the right idea to move forward and this has happened many times throughout history i mean you look at um, things that were considered morally acceptable before i mean let's, let's take for example forms of execution of prisoners there were all sorts of forms of execution of prisoners that um, that this country used to consider to be acceptable or Western Europe used to be considered acceptable that no longer is considered acceptable. Let's take the form of the very notion of the fact that the state sanctions and carries out execution of prisoners today in this country. That should not be acceptable. I don't think that's, that should be morally acceptable. And we currently do it. Obviously, we do it, we can do it federally. We do it in multiple states. I'm pretty convinced that we'll get to a place where we will look back on this moment and say it, it was incredible that uh, that people lived in a time when the state sanctioned execution of prisoners particularly given the enormous problems with the with the criminal justice system and with the carceral system so I'm, I'm simply saying this to say that this requires the engagement of good people in changing hearts and changing minds making the argument making an argument with data and making an argument with moral clarity to move the world forward the I realize that the counter to what I'm saying may seem like, well, my goodness, that takes such a long time. And it does, it does. Change, wholesale, large scale change takes a long time. I think that I don't mean that in a way to discourage the ardor of activism. I really do not. I think it's always been that way in history. I, I wrote a piece about the need for radical vision and incremental progress. 
And I think it's important to have a radical vision. I think the vision you and I are talking about is a radical vision, but to accept the fact that progress is incremental. And the reason progress is incremental is because there are many other people who disagree with you. And I think one of the mistakes we often make when we uh, think of this from an activist mindset is we think, well, everybody agrees with me or surely everybody sees this. And of course we forget that because it's selection, we're around people who are like us, who think like us. The hard, hard work is convincing everybody else and moving them forward unless we want to just somehow magically poof, disappear, everybody else disagrees with us. And of course, you and I both realize the fundamental problems with that thinking. So progress is incremental and it's hard work to get to it, but I think it's important to have a radical vision as to where we're trying to get to. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, and I think that sort of, that, that, that discussion sort of leads into what you mentioned in your book, especially about the Overton window and how that idea of, of moving um, our moral truths and especially related to health and morality and have changed so much over the last um, several centuries. And, and, and you seem to argue that there's more and there's a lot more we can change. And, and of course, with global inequalities, that's the case. Um, but do you think that this shifting, this gradual change, is it, is it incurring costs because it's taking so long? And like, how, how do we of combat course. that? Yeah. Of course it is. Of course it is. And it's terrible. And it's terrible. I mean, why is it? We could go on, you and I could go on and list the things that currently are acceptable that should be unacceptable. We talked about the global health inequity should be unacceptable. We talked about the fact that uh, we have a, um, a prison industrial complex that, that where the state executes people, which should be unacceptable. Why should, be, why should it be acceptable that we turn away children and families at the border who could actually have a much better life here when they're actually fleeing violence and trauma in other countries? Why should that be acceptable? And I'm convinced that all these things will become unacceptable eventually. Now, when I say eventually, I am accepting the fact that today, let's just focus on executions. We're talking about that. Somebody may, may be executed. I, I don't know that. Um, but maybe it will be today, maybe tomorrow. And that, um, so there are real lives that are being affected, real lives being affected by all of these things that um, should be unacceptable. And at some level, it makes one mad. And it should make one mad. It's like, well, we should fix this now because lives are being affected it's just not how the world works because there are enormous complexities enormous numbers of people have to be brought along who do not see these things as clearly as you and i do and also maybe you and i are wrong on some things and actually the 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 plurality of voices can help us get collectively to where we are but it requires good people of good conscience to be unyielding in pushing their ideas forward to push the world to a better place. Yeah, yeah, that's, I think that's a, a beautiful way of, of describing that. And sort of on the same vein of, of morality, um, in, in your book, you sort of describe the idea of stigma in public health, starting from the flagellance of the, the time in the, in the, of the Black Death and um, this group of people who believe the plague to be a form of divine punishment um, and, and so obviously we don't see much of that anymore, especially in a politically or socially relevant um, sphere, but, but we've, we have seen people who, who sort of shame and, and, and stigmatize, especially from the public health angle, whether it be through messaging that kind of is paternalistic or can potentially offend people, um, like whether it be from the CDC or, or people of authority who, who, who are often a little judgmental about personal decisions relating to the vaccine, et cetera. Um, do you think that's sort of been a major factor in, in, in affecting how we, we see or how health is, public health in America is, is perceived? Like, do you think that we could work to be better as conveyors of public health in being less stigmatizing and, and with reference to COVID-19 especially? Yes, absolutely. I, I actually think public health has uh, done quite a few things wrong in this time. I've written about this. And uh, one of those things has been that we have been intolerant of the, these diversity of perspectives. This goes a little bit to the previous conversation where I think we have, we in public health may have clarity and you know, we say, well, this is such the right thing to do. And why doesn't everybody just see this? Why doesn't everybody just fall in line? We can make, make a better world. It's not 
that, that is not reality. Reality is that people, for whatever reason, have different perspectives and it's hard work to use data and to use moral reasoning to bring people along. And we in public health have shown ourselves in a time of COVID to be not very good at that, to actually not, to not be very good at all about listening to plurality of voices and to, to get to saying, how, how, how could you not get vaccinated? One of the phrases which I often feel is um, troubling is when people will say things like, I don't understand how somebody could not get vaccinated. And to which the answer is, well, if we don't understand, given the fact that there are many people who don't want to get vaccinated, it means we're not thinking hard enough because many people are just not to be vaccinated. So it's our job to understand them. And I would extend that, by the way, to some of our larger political divisions. We've had such divided uh, political landscape. I mean, how many times, if I may push, have you heard in your circles, people say, I don't understand how anybody could vote for Donald Trump. Well, many my answer times, to that, yeah. many times. Well, my answer to that is, I don't know, but half the country actually vote for Donald Trump, more or less, right. give or take. Right? So th the fact that we can't understand that means we're not thinking hard enough about it. And it means that we have real divisions. Our job should be to say, our job should be to say, that here are reasons why X is the right path. I understand that you think Y is the right path, and I'm here to convince you so that we can then achieve our radical vision. A colleague of mine uh, would say, if we disagree, it means we haven't talked long enough. And I appreciate that. And But the answer certainly is talking, the conversation. The answer is not saying, how could you think that? I don't understand that. I mean, let, I'll go back for a second to the example I've used a few times in, in, in this conversation, which is about uh, state-sponsored execution, which I, I find, as you can probably tell from my, my voice on this, morally abhorrent. But... I also realized that actually polls didn't show the majority of Americans actually find it fine. Actually, the majority of Americans think that it is an okay thing for the state to do. So my job is to engage in the data and in the moral argument that changes the mind of, of the people who feel different than I do. Me saying, I don't understand how you could possibly think that that is okay is utterly unhelpful. And I have to recognize that it's a long slog to get there. Right, right. And uh, I guess sort of that feeds into the overly moralizing way in which we can speak down to others and, and how we communicate kind of feeds into the, the idea of being intolerant and, and, and being uh, unproductive in, in our discussions. It, it is, uh, and, and I tend to feel like, I'm, I apologize, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, that, um, yeah, no worries. It, uh, it's on you, and you, I mean us, if you see clearly the right path, it's on you to convince others. It's not on others to come to you. Because others, they're happy with the way things are. If you see the right path and the right path requires change, it's on you to bring others along. It's your responsibility. And you cannot, you cannot say, well, I just, they should just recognize it's the right thing. No, it's on you to make the argument. And I've, I've written before, that I see the job of scientists, if I just bring it home for a second, as making the argument, making a data argument and making a moral argument, that we need to be able to show the data and make a moral argument about why it matters. So we need to change values and show data. Both of those, I think, matter to those of us who are in science or who are in the academy. And it requires, and it is hard work because there are a lot of people who, whose minds need to be changed, but that hard work needs to have the humility to realize there are many different perspectives and that we want to hear the voices of many so that the voice of many then coalesce around the right thing to do. And history teaches us that it happens. It happens. I started the book, as you know, with a chapter about how much we've improved. And I find sometimes in the activist moment, we forget that, right? We say, well, there's so many problems. Of course there are problems, but it's not true that we have not improved. Look, the world and the country are a better place than they were 50 years ago. They simply are. They simply are on any number of dimensions, a number of health dimensions, a number of social dimensions, a number of economic dimensions. We are better. The world is better than it was 50 years ago. That is not in contradiction with saying there's a lot of things that we should improve, but we should not forget that the world is a better place to be. You know, in the, in the sort of sci-fi thing, well, if you could come back at any time in history, when would you come back? Well, the answer is today, or preferably 100 years from now because the world will be better 100 years from now.
Yeah, and um, I guess like you're almost sort of preempting this, this the following question, but I'll ask it anyway. We ask this to all of our guests right as we close our interviews. But since the name of our podcast is Policy Punchline, we like to ask our guests, what's the punchline uh, to your to your argument? What do you think the most important thing that our listeners should walk away with is? And and yeah. you might you might have already answered that, but you're welcome to, yeah, to go think- further. I think the punchline to my to, to the whole book and to hold this conversation is that there will be no improvement, no better health, whether it's during pandemic or not, unless we pay attention to the underlying social and economic forces that generate our health. And that is a tough job. And what I know is going to happen after the pandemic, and it's already beginning to happen, right? There'll be a lot of books, a lot of ideas about vaccines and about viral detection and all that. All of that is good. Again, it's an end argument, not an argument argument. But I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that a lot of what happened during COVID was not because of absence of therapeutics. It's because of our social and economic structures. And that is, uh, means that we should use COVID as a reason, even though arguably we didn't need COVID as a reason, but to galvanize our attention to these underlying structures. All right. Well, thank you so much, Professor Galea, for coming onto the show. This was a very informative and, and edifying discussion. Um, and I'd like to our listeners to uh, keep an eye out for Professor Galea's book, The Contagion Next Time, which comes out on November 1st, and I believe is available to pre-order. Um, Professor Galea, is there any other way we could support your work? Um, do you have any sort of social media presence or anything like that we could keep up with? Uh, we, we do. I have a website, sandrogalea.org, which actually my writing is on. And um, I usually try to put out notes of things I write um, through Twitter. But um, I think the biggest thing that um, you and the audience can do to support the work is to spread this message. I feel like if 10 people can convince 10 other people and those 10 people convince 10 other people, that's part of changing what we talk about when we talk about health. And it's part of making sure that these ideas live on. I, I, it's a real privilege to write a book and have some people read it. And the, the reason one writes a book is to make the argument that we've been talking about. So I want to thank you for having the conversation. I want to thank you for giving me the uh, the forum to push this conversation forward because fundamentally it's that conversation that changes minds. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Galea. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.